A lot of faculty in, in information systems will use uh, course packets um, because the material is very current and we're training managers by having them read the material that they're going to be reading as a manager. So that might include articles from Business Week, Forbes, or Fortune. Now I would found that a number of the firms that we were covering um, were very interesting, but some of the articles that we had from a few years ago had nuggets of really good material in there surrounded by a lot of material that was out of date. So I started writing my own updated versions of the cases where I tried to keep the tone snappy in the way that you might find in the trade press, but also wrap durable theory around it and continue to refresh and renew the content every year. Well, I was approached by uh, a company called Flat World Knowledge that um, it's actually very exciting for, for me as an author because I think they hit the sweet spot. On one hand, uh, an author wants to have the biggest impact that they can have. So they'd like their material to be dispersed as, as widely as possible. Uh, on the, the other hand, um, you know, when you're doing work, you kind of need to be compensated for that work. And uh, you know, if you're writing a, a textbook, um, you, you know, there, there should be something behind that in order to give you the incentive to do a real qual high quality work and to make that a priority in your life. Well, the folks at Flatworld give the content away for free, and they um, also offer uh, royalties if anybody buys the dead tree version of the text. The text actually sells for a fraction of what a conventional text would sell for, too. So um, the leading uh, book and in information system sells for about $185 list, and my text sells for $35 list if you were to buy the dead tree version. So Amazon this week introduced um, uh, rentable textbooks on the Kindle. But the rentable cost of the bestseller in my discipline is actually more than the full purchase price of the Dead Tree version, and all of my content is available online for free. Now, this really disrupts the industry in, in interesting ways. That the first is, is um, you know, faculty would never assign a second textbook at $195 a pop. But they would assign a few chapters, especially if they're cutting edge chapters. And, and you know, open material tends to be released very, very quickly. For example, for fall release, I'm editing today information on Google's new Google Plus initiative and Netflix repricing initiative that hopefully will make the case for, uh, to end up on the shelves in just a few weeks for our students. Um, so I'm able to refresh the content and make it very current. So faculty will adopt that. They'll try out a few chapters. And then they'll get feedback from the students that they really like the material. And then they'll adopt the whole text. So within the first year, we were able to um, you know, see that this textbook was adopted by 60% of the, the, or six of the top 10 in, um, US News leading information systems programs. It had well over 100 uh, adopting universities. And the feedback from it has is, is been tremendous. So that's great. It's been very disruptive. It's been able to get out there, be sampled, and um, you know, really stand on its own merits. In addition, by giving the material away for free, um, you know, uh, as a scholar, it's, it's great to see that your work has, has an impact. And, and in fact, that's what I've been able to see. So for example, at the end of next month, I'm headed to um, give the keynote talk at the African International Business and Management Conference in Nairobi. And this is an opportunity that never would have happened before. But um, students at the University of Nairobi were using my text. And faculty members reached out to me and said, we'd love to give you the keynote, or we'd love for you to give the keynote. And they're actually flying me over and putting me up in a hotel. Um, so it's, it's wonderful. And those are the kinds of benefits that I think can happen to faculty that are more open with their um, scholarly contribution. I think that's really what we want to encourage. The tricky thing is to try to find a model that both you know, treats um, high quality faculty contributions as work and that there's compensation for it and recognition for it. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, also making sure that the walls come down and that that material is able to stand on its own merits and um, you know, be consumed and, and hopefully have an impact. The, the copyright for scholarly journal articles depends on the journal. And um, faculty typically sign a release form at the time that uh, those journal articles are published. And they vary. Sometimes the journal uh, holds the full copyright. Sometimes it's jointly held with the faculty member. Most of the journals in my discipline understand that faculty members would like to post their work online. Um, some have writers that it's only uh, offered for free online for use in courses or that type of thing. Um, others, uh, Harvard Business School Publishing in particular, they're um, very strict about the dissemination of the product. And so for example, for an article that I wrote in Harvard Business Review, uh, I'm not able to distribute that to my students without further licensing it from Harvard Business School Publishing. So it varies. For, um, it's something that I pay very close attention to because it really helps scholars to have their material as accessible as possible. And in fact, I think that we're seeing Google, for many faculty that are doing background researches, 
uh, it is becoming um, the first choice platform to, to try to scan out and find out what's available. And that's because not only do you have a number of scholarly journals that are there, but you also have a number of working papers where the, copyright, the final version isn't done yet. You can see what scholars are, are doing in certain areas. There are also um, conference proceedings and class notes and things like that that are online. So if you're not, material is not accessible via Google, it's as if you don't exist to a huge portion of academe. So uh, you know, I've been on the faculty for 14 years, and since that very first year, whenever I had the opportunity to post my material online, I would do that, my, my scholarly research work. And in several cases, since I'd been doing this for quite some time, I was the first person that asked the journal, and they reworked their policy, or they gave me written permission to be able to do that. I can say, as a result, um, you know, bumped up my citation count. Um, that's sort of a cynical way to look at it. I think the most important thing as faculty members is people are reading your work. You spend so much time on it. Um, you know, hopefully you're proud of the work that you're doing. You want it to be accessible. And um, you know, Google is a huge engine around that. And of course, Google has a, a service now called Google Scholar, which is specifically targeted at academics and helping them discover more academic material. Uh, you know, the, the uh, other thing that, that's very important in um, providing open access is that a lot of that material is funded by public grants. In, in my department, we have you know, an individual that has um, an NSF grant, for example. And um, you know, there is an argument that that material should be accessible by citizens of the government and organization within the governments that had funded those. Um, so open access really does do dovetail with um, uh, you know, the goals, I think, of a number of our sponsors. I think it also goes beyond that, too, though. I mean, the more accessible your material is, um, there is this virtuous cycle that happens as a scholar. Uh, folks will comment on your research. They'll make you a better researcher. There's more input for potential collaborators. Um, there's uh, a more um, assignment of impact so that uh, you know, if you want to demonstrate to your university that your work is, is indeed um, you know, elevating scholarship in general, you have data to be able to deliver uh, on that. So um, you know, openness is absolutely the way uh, that academic research is, is going to happen. Um, there are going to be some bumps along the road and some things that we haven't figured out yet. Uh, there are a lot of academics that have frustration around the peer review process. Can we use um, uh, open access as one model to challenge peer review or to improve peer review is probably a better way to put that. The cycle time in my discipline it's very common for it to be three years to go from uh, starting work on a project to finally appearing in journals, sometimes even longer. And when you teach um, and you do scholarship uh, that involves firms like Facebook and Google and social media, three years plus is really just too much to think that your work is going to have um, immediate resonance with those in practice. The world changes too quickly. So whatever we can do to reduce that cycle time and still maintain scholarship quality is important. There's a, a last piece in, in openness, too, that oftentimes folks ask me about. Um, you know, folks worry about plagiarism. Are people going to take my content? Are they going to take credit from my content? It's actually possible through my publisher for faculty members to change my original work. They can remove paragraphs. They can add additional material to my book. Um, you know, I, I confess that at first that made me feel a little unusual and uncomfortable. But um, having been involved in this for a while, the internet and open access is actually your friend. It puts a stake in the ground that says, you know, you were the first person to come up with this idea. This is your original work. And in fact, it's the foe of the plagiarist because it becomes very easy to expose somebody that's copied your work, that's trying to um, benefit from, from the, the effort that you put in. Uh, it also raises the bar, I think, on all scholars because we want to really make sure that we've crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and, and we've cited our material appropriately. But um, you know, it's, it's a, a real benefit, I think, to that. And in fact, it's far more um, a positive development in terms of being able to protect somebody's intellectual uh, um, and the credit associated with their intellectual contribution than it is uh, you know, something that could uh, have um, theft uh, and, and discreditation associated with it. I'm not sure our university needs to mandate open access, but I will tell you um, I believe in the market mechanisms uh, working in ways that demand open access. If you're a faculty member that hoards your material and puts it behind a paywall, you are less accessible. And if you are less accessible, um, you will have less impact as a scholar. We're going to see this play out in lots of different ways, too. Um, you know, many public intellectuals have uh, uh, raised their profile because they have been active participants in social media. Now, again, the market forces work, and, and hopefully they will endorse 
um, you know, individuals that have important, impactful things to say. And they can also expose charlatans, too. But um, you know, if you're doing really good work and you're hoarding that work, um, uh, you, know, you simply won't be seen. And you're, it's going to be very clear to individuals very soon, if it's not already clear to them, that um, they are limiting their career, the impact of their hard work, if they are not open. I, I should say, let me, I'll, I'll offer a little bit more in there, too. You know, this is a, an easier question around academic journals, I think, too. Openness is an easier question around academic journals. And the reason for that is because we're not paid to write scholarly articles. Um, and the coin of the realm really is scholarly article writing. Where it is um, potentially very important is for textbook authors or for authors that write trade press or, or those kinds of things. And certainly, you know, the world of, of literature and novels is very different. Um, but, uh, you know, there's uh, the folks that benefit from um, closed access to research and highly paid access to research are those individuals that benefit from the regimes that control that copyright. Um, you know, whether it's uh, licensing organizations, the uh, governance and leadership bodies of those organizations. And I think it's untenable to think that those walls are going to hold over time. The tricky piece is textbook authorship. And, um, I can't tell you I know where that's going to, to go in the future. As a textbook author, though, um, it has never been easier for me to self-publish, but I also recognize my limitations as an author. Um, you know, I'm proud of the work that I've written, but I also very much need an editor. Um, you know, it's good to have somebody that uh, does grammar check, that um, you know, sharpens up my prose when I'm sloppy. Um, my, uh, um, my publisher also provides me with an opportunity for copyright clearance, for images, for graphic arts, for layout work. Um, they also promote my work, and they also provide revenue collection if folks choose to purchase you know, the fur fee um, delivery mechanisms for the content. I also want to be clear about that in that the, the text itself, the whole version of it is available online, and you know, when you buy print, you simply buy a dead tree version of what you have online. Students currently find it very convenient to buy the dead tree version. Um, and I think the price point is low enough that um, you know, it's not hugely burdensome to students to buy a $35 textbook as opposed to a $185 textbook. Um, but we'll see where technology takes us in the future, too. When the campus is full of students running around with iPads, you, know, you can already read my book on a, on a smartphone, and it, it's, it's, lo it's legible on a smartphone. Um, you know, the world may change, and that may impact uh, models and author incentives and those kinds of things. Part of the challenge for universities, I think, are for um, promotion and tenure committees to get their head around the fact that um, the coin of the realm is changing in that there are now different coins in the realm. It's not simply conventional scholarly publishing that adds to the impactful base of scholarship. And um, you know, I'm really proud of the time that I spent, which was taken away from conventional research and it was put into this book that has had um, you know, a really important role in uh, training information system students worldwide. And of all of the things that I've been involved in, and again, you know, I've published on, uh, articles in, in top journals, um, I'm most proud of this open textbook project I've been involved in. It's, it's tricky when, when you, um, in the world of, of open products, whether it's open source software or um, open source content, because you know, the reality is there needs to be some sort of financial sustaining incentive for individuals to produce the content. And finding along the continuum of um, making it entirely fee-based or making it entirely free is, is really difficult for us to find. And you know, as an author, sometimes I, um, I'm not as vocal in terms of the material that I produced and sharing it in public forum um, uh, were for I IS faculty member, s specifically because you know I'm worried that, that it's going to come across as me being overly commercially motivated. Um, you know that said, uh, you know it is nice for me to be able to put some content up there and to allow it to be serendipitously discovered via Google. And my publisher also does a lot of the um, you know the promotion that I might feel a little bit uncomfortable with. So we're also part of this um, uh, regime change and etiquette change in terms of. You know, how do we promote our work? How do we tactfully share with others that we've got content that's out there? And, um, and you know, how do we feel about saying, OK, this is free, but if you want the same exact thing but in a different delivery mechanism, you're going to have to pay? Um, you know, those are all to be reconciled uh, going forward. Sure. On, on this piece of peer review, too, oftentimes when uh, academics have this debate, 
Um, they come down on one side ver or the other side, assuming that the regime is going to entirely change and we're going to move from peer review to some you know, wild west social media um, open access mechanism where you know, work isn't uh, effectively screened for its quality and, and legitimacy. But in fact, you know, I think what we're going to see are different kinds of material coming forward and evaluated in various different methods. And a really interesting example of that showed up in our own work. Um, so colleagues and I, a um, uh, couple of years ago, we were studying social media in the medical field. And we were studying a firm in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts that um, had a social community that um, dealt with ALS patients, so patients that have a terrible debilitating disease. There's no cure for it. There aren't effective medical treatments for it. And there was an early indication from a publication in an Italian medical journal that suggested that ALS patients could see improved um, uh, health and, 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 and benefits from uh, uh, taking the drug lithium. Now, lithium is a generic drug, and um, you know, trying to get a clinical trial funded to look at this would be extraordinarily difficult. It's a multi-million dollar endeavor. The um, drug companies don't necessarily have a dog in that fight. Um, you know, they, they're not going to make a lot of money off of a generic drug. Um, there are a lot of approval processes that need to go through and an infrastructure that happen. But the folks at this particular social network called Patients Like Me launched what they called a clinical trial-like experiment. And this is very controversial because you know, you've got patients essentially doing experiments on themselves. But there are a bunch of people, unfortunately, that have ALS that, 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 that also um, have experience in clinical trials. They ran this clinical trial-like experiment. Within just a few months, they were able to say clearly to the community, um, we have no indication that the drug lithium benefits ALS patients. So um, you know, they did a great service to the community in, in preventing false hope from being generated, from being pati preventing patients that perhaps have economic constraints on the resources, from um, you know, going and spending money on, on uh, you know, particular medications that weren't going to be an impact. Now that's controversial, because we can all think of scenarios where public research um, in the medical area where there aren't appropriate parameters around it could be damaging. But the genie is out of the bottle and we are going to see more public commentary on our work and there are going to be certain kinds of research that should be fast-tracked or that will inevitably be fast-tracked where the community will pull uh, that research forward and say this is too important simply to leave to the old regime. We need to bring this out into the open. We're going to shed a lot of light on it. Sometimes we're going to be wrong, but we hope most of the time we're right and that in um, aggregate there are more benefits than downsides for these kinds of things. There are negative sides of peer review that I think also need to be discussed. Oftentimes, as an author, you know, you're very proud of your work. You feel um, confident in um, your research methods and your approach and in your conclusion. And um, you know, when peer review corrects issues with your scholarly work, you welcome that as a scholar, as an honest scholar. But there are also times, I think, that all scholars encounter a review process that's channeling their work and they're bumping it and they're changing it in ways that, that they hadn't intended to and really aren't fully comfortable with, but we will do it in order to satisfy and feed the beast. You know, there are four, five, six reviewers that are going to be uh, responsible to getting your journal uh, accepted. If you're a faculty member that's up for promotion or tenure, um, you know, you're going to, um, you know, really, you know, pay into those kinds of systems and those kinds of, of regimes. I think what open access potentially does is it gives the faculty member far more freedom to be honest and true to their original vision. Now, Again, our role as scholars is to make sure that we shed light on high quality research and, and make sure that that work is high quality, I should say. Expose um, uh, you know, poorly designed work or, or certainly work that, that has ethical gaps in it or, or that just isn't executed properly. But um, you know, open access, I think, not only benefits the consumers of this, it tremendously benefits the creators in this in that um, you know, their vision for their project can potentially be seen more true than the distortive effects potentially of a very small group of individuals that may at times, you know, it, it happens occasionally, uh, have their own political reasons of, of shaping articles and demanding citation or um, you know, research be brought in a certain way or emphasizes or de-emphasizes certain topics.